So when we think of an ideal day, we usually think of things that were consistent. Were the lights on? Did the faucets work? Was the heat on? These high standards that we have for our day-to-day -day lives most definitely also apply to our standards for energy. If energy fails, it's inconsistent. If it's inconsistent, we get annoyed. Humans aren't the most patient creatures. So if we have this high standard for our energy consumption, if we want it to be really consistent, I'd imagine we're doing a lot to make sure that we are consistent. Unfortunately, renewable energy sources have proven to be unreliable. So we continue to rely on non-renewable resources. Wind, literally subject to the whims of nature. Sun, well, besides night, if it's cloudy, it can cause solar panels to only output 10 to 25% of their total capacity on any given day. So with these kinds of stats, we know that there's something needs to be done about how we use renewable energy. And we know that there's something that needs to be improved. So we've been thinking about storage. We don't have access to the sun 100% of the time, night. So we need to maximize the storage for when we do have access to it, when we do get surplus energy. And we've had a couple of really interesting ways that we do that, and one of them is by storing it as hydrogen. So using something called electrolysis, we're able to use an electric current to separate water into oxygen and hydrogen, and then store the hydrogen as fuel to be used later. Another really cool example is storing it in molten salt. So a renewable energy company in Spain figured out that molten salt doesn't change physical state even when it's under high temperature. So this is really cool because we can store the energy in it and then when it comes time to actually use it, we can use it just as we do anything else to create energy with the turbine. But even if we use these two things and we improved storage, we're still not harnessing enough energy from the sun. Every hour, the sun's rays that reach Earth are enough to power the entire world's energy consumption for over a year. Every single hour. And we're not harnessing even a fraction of that. So my question is, why are we trying to improve the status quo instead of just changing the status quo? Instead of trying to harness energy from here, why don't we just move closer to the source? This is possible thanks to wireless energy transfer. And it's something that we should and can be working on because of something called microwave power transfer. So wireless energy transfer is going to completely disrupt the way that we harness and use energy and have a po positive environmental impact on the environment in two ways. Let's start with inductive coupling. So this is how we're actually gonna be using the energy when it's on Earth. So with inductive coupling, I created this thing called a Tesla coil. You can hit the video. So a Tesla coil was first invented by Nikola Tesla. Um, and basically, it uses the principle of inductive coupling, which I'll explain in just a second, to wirelessly illuminate a light bulb. And it does this because I've created a larger than normal magnetic field. So when I bring the light bulb closer to the coil, which is where the magnetic field is radiating from, it wirelessly lights up. So now let's explain it. So let's start with the electric field. An electric field is basically just the effect that a source charge, which we can define here as a large Q, has on other intruding charged particles, which we can call the um, test charge, which is small Q. So then to actually define an electric field, we can use this equation, which I've shown how we can simplify it, but I'll talk about the very first one, where we use Coulomb's constant, which is kind of like pi, but for physics multiplied by the product of the source charge and the test charge, divided by the distance between the source charge and test charge squared. Then we have the magnetic field. Magnetic fields are created when a charged particle is in motion. And we can define this using Lorentz force law, which states that the well, small q represents a fixed charge at a constant velocity v within a defined or fixed magnetic field b to find f force. And this diagram I have here shows the magnetic field lines for a bar magnet. So now we understand the other two pieces, we can talk about an electromagnetic field. So every charged particle has an electric field, but when it becomes an electric current and it starts moving, that magnetic field also comes into existence. So now you have both of these fields. Using the theories of electromagnetism, I can explain how I created uh, the Tesla coil. So remember how I said I created a larger than normal magnetic field? 
Well, by coiling the wire, that copper, wi that copper wire, I was able to expand how big that magnetic field was. And by doing that, bringing the light bulb closer to that coil, it was able to induce a current or a charge, which is what caused it to light up. Now let's talk about the one with higher stakes, MPT, or microwave power transfer. So this is how we're going to be able to actually transfer the energy from the sun to Earth without wires. So a solar panel in general works by using photons and an electric um, electron begins to move and that creates a direct current. And that direct current isn't something that's unique because we already do this, but the solar system in space would also have a satellite. And that satellite would take that DC and convert it into a microwave and then transmit that microwave to a receiver back on Earth. Well, let's take a closer look at that process. This is called the MPT system. So once you get your direct current and you have your microwave transmitter, it becomes a microwave through something called a microwave generator. And that's that first part over there. Then it goes through something called the Koch's waveguide adapter. Sounds really fancy. All it is is like a hollow tube, and it makes sure that the waves go in just one direction. So it's kind of like, it looks like this, and it's kind of like if I took a flashlight and I sh like shined it through um, like a tunnel, it would make sure that for the length of that tunnel, it would only be traveling in one direction because of the reflections, but then when it got out of the tunnel, it would disperse again. The next part is called the waveguide circulator, and this is going to differentiate the signals from those that are transmitted and those that are received. And the final part is the tuner and directional coupler. So what the coupler does is it differentiates signal by signal propagation direction, really fancy way of just saying, again, the direction that the waves are traveling in, and then it pairs or couples them before it turns them into an in intermission line, um, which is then sent out as microwave radiation to the receiver. So this is just half of the system. This is how we get that direct current from the sun and we convert it into the microwave then we actually have to receive it. So the antenna receives it, and then it goes through something called the low-pass filter. The low-pass filter will stop any higher frequency waves from passing and only allow those with lower frequencies through. Then it goes on to the most important part of this whole process, which is the matching network. The matching network does something called impediment matching. So it maximizes power retention by making sure that the net resistance of both circuits is zero. So a good way to explain this is like if I had a jug that had two liters of water and a cup that could only take one, and I kept pouring the water, I'd lose a liter of water because one was greater than the other. In this case, we have two circuits, the transmitter and the receiver. If the resistance is not equal, we experience power loss, which is something we absolutely don't want. And then the last part is the rectifier, and this converts the radiation back to DC. So impediment matching is what gives the MPT system a 99.9% .9 power retention reliability rate. That's insanely good. And if we can use this system as opposed to what we do right now, we'd be capturing so much more energy. This system was realized to be as genius as I'm making it out to be by Japan. And JAXA is currently figuring out how we can create a space solar power system by 2031. So wireless energy has the potential to do things like wirelessly charge internal medical devices or simplify electric cars and stop the production of cables, their plastics and non-biodegradable outputs, and that's all great. But imagine having a world where we have a constant source of green energy. The implications of this are huge. Solar energy would no longer be affected by things like the weather. If there's like something like an earthquake were to happen and we have no wires, also unaffected. But the greatest, most important detail is that we just be getting so much more energy. Solar irradiance in space is 40 times greater than it is on Earth. That basically means that those solar panels will be getting eight times more energy than they would on Earth, with 100% direct access to the sun all of the time. I talked about consistency. Wanting consistency and to keep having high standards for energy is key, but it might just also be the key degree. Thank you.